Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Sometimes as we were planning our landscaping, we need a plant that will dress up a corner of the house, hide an unsightly area, or maybe add vertical interest in our flower bed. This week on Prairie Yard and Garden, we are going to find out about a super plant that can do all those things. Join me as we learn about the beautiful perennial called Clematis. Welcome to Prairie Yard and Garden. I'm host Mary Holm and this week we are joined by Mike Hager who is going to talk about a great perennial called Clematis. Mike is the author of an excellent gardening book called Growing Perennials in Cold Climates. He has agreed to meet us at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum to teach us how easy it is to grow Clematis. Welcome Mike. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Now first off how do you pronounce the word clematis? I've heard clematis, clematis, or clematis. Can you tell us what's the right way to say well, it? Well, yeah, I, there isn't really a right or wrong there. One, one's a more northerly pronunciation, one's a more southerly pronunciation. So a lot of gardeners in the north tend to say clematis, and a lot of gardeners in the south tend to say clematis. Both are accepted pronunciations in the horticultural world. So I think one of those two is accurate and you can go with either one of them, you aren't going to be wrong. Now could you please tell us what exactly is a clematis? Well technically uh, clematis are classified as woody plants um, even though they're, they can range from types that have very persistent woody stems to some that are totally herbaceous and natural but but if you look in uh, plant classification usually they're lumped with woody plants. For us in the north here uh, for all practical purposes, a great majority of them are, are herbaceous perennials in nature because they die back to the snow line or even to the ground. So we tend to treat them as we would most perennials in the garden. But as you go into warmer regions farther south, uh, some of them do have very persistent woody stems every year and they come back. Where would you plant a clematis? Well, the one thing to remember about them as a general rule is they love to have their heads in the sun and their feet in the shade. That's kind of an old, the old adage that's gone with them for years. And basically what that boils down to is a meaning that they need lots of light to get really good flowering. They need uh, full sun to very light shade, yet they do not like uh, situations where their root systems are uh, subjected to dry periods. Uh, they tend to like evenly moist soil, some of those kinds of things. So. Uh, picking that site with that in mind um, I think is important, but I think for the maximum flowering you really need to be more on the highlight end of the spectrum. Can you ever take and plant something in front of the plants in order to shade that root system a little bit more? Absolutely. There's a couple ways you can address that. One is, uh, as has been done here in the Arboretum, that's to mulch the root zones you know, with an organic mulch. That will help retain that cool, cool moist kind of environment that the root system's like. Or you can do a ground cover, a living ground cover. Use plants as that living mulch, so to speak, that will achieve the same kind of function as long as they aren't very deeply rooted and are going to rob a lot of soil moisture and nutrients. But most ground covers, uh, particularly herbaceous type ground covers, could be utilized uh, to give that, uh, shade that sun away from the ground and prevent the, uh, the rapid, chain, rapid uh, from very dry soils to very moist soils. Um, so there's a couple ways you can approach that and they both work. 
Could you give us suggestions of plants that you could take and plant in front of a clematis? Oh, I would think things like some of the low-growing uh, perennial geraniums, the hardy, hardy cranes bills would be great. Uh, uh, low catnets, um, you know, uh, just maybe a couple examples. I think the, the range of possibilities is pretty great, but I think if you think more in terms of any of those kinds of plants that we might utilize as a ground cover somewhere in the landscape, they can serve that same function underneath that vine. So, uh, What are some uses for the clematis? Well, the traditional use has been, as we're seeing it here today, up on a trellis or up, up against a wall. Um, and and uh, when we talk a little bit about uh, winter issues and some of that kind of thing, we can talk about some of the pros and cons with that. I think the one thing us Midwestern gardeners don't do well, and that is to take them and use them in other fashions. For, say, for example, uh, plant it at the base of a shrub or a small tree. And, and then allowing that vine to ramble up the trunk of that tree, and the, you know, it will seek the edges for flowering and so you can actually have a shrub with a clematis blooming in it or you could have a crab apple with a clematis blooming in it. you could have a yew in the landscape with a clematis blooming in it. and the beauty of that approach again is that you're going to tend to put the plant at the base of that uh, woody plant where it's probably not going to be subjected to a lot of extremes in terms of soil moistures it's going to get the shading that we've already talked about over the root systems yet the top can seek out the highlight to, uh, to uh, develop and uh, buds and then to flower as well. So there, you, you do have a number of options. I think most people, when they talk about this group of plants, tends to think about the vining types. Mm -hmm. And the thing you also have to remember about the vining types is that they have no way to attach themselves to anything. They climb by wrapping their leaf tendril or their leaf stalk around something. So, and, and as you can see here at the Arboretum, they're allowed to climb up on some chicken wire on the fences. And so they can wrap their leaf tendrils around those and, or, and find their way up. So, so you have to provide something like that or a string or something that they can wrap that tendril around in order for it to get them to climb. Because if you don't do that, if there's nothing to climb on, they're just going to run across the ground. They aren't going to climb. Do you need two clematis plants in order to get them to flower? No, you do not. You don't, okay? No, no. So they're, they're self, they're self fertile. So you can plant one in your garden on the on the fence or whatever, and you will get a good show of flowers out of the one plant. So approximately, what size will clematis uh, end up being? Um, say, for example, that you've got an arbor that is generally what three feet, um, or a trellis that's three feet wide, and uh, maybe five to six feet tall. How many clematis will you need to cover that nicely? The answer there again depends very much on the variety involved, but pretty much the answer to the question is one. Okay. Unless you're dealing with some of the really more, very modern dwarf types, then you may need more. But typic on most clematis that are available in the industry today, one plant will cover that within two, three years, we'll cover that over. What are the different varieties or different types of clematis and which ones are your favorites? <laughs> Well, this is a very, very, very large group of plants. If you look worldwide, there are well over 300 species of clematis distributed throughout the world. So the, uh, the genetic pool to draw off of there is, you know, in terms of hybridization, is very, very large. And, uh, uh, you know, in commerce today, I don't really know how many cultivars are in commerce today. I think uh, when I did the revision of growing perennials in cold climates, I would venture to guess that there's probably easily a couple hundred cultivars in that book, and that's the tip of the iceberg. So, uh, you know, so uh, either it's really hard to answer that favorite question because this group is so large. It has actually been grouped uh, by types, pretty much based upon breeding backgrounds of them. And uh, so, you know, there's great ones within each one of those groups, and there's probably eight or ten different groups within uh, Clematis. And, uh, for example, I think if I'm going to pick out one of my favorites, and probably one of the favorites of a lot of people are the old Jackmanai types. And the beauty of those is that we know they're good performers for us here. They're vigorous. Um, you know, the winter's not an issue with them. They're prolific bloomers, and so you can go old Jackmanite with the big purple flowers, or there's a white form, there's a red form. There are a number of other selections within that. Those tend to be very good, reliable performers for us. If you like something that isn't maybe quite as large flowered, it's a little more subtle, but maybe closer to the species kind of look, there's a group called the, the uh, vit viticella types, the vit viticella group, which tend to be smaller flowered. Again, very hardy, very vigorous. Uh, 
not as large in individual flowers, but absolutely smothered in bloom. So when they're in full flower, you don't really even see the green of the foliage. So we happen to be standing here by a white flowered one that's been around for a long time. It's one called Haldeen. Uh, you know, it's not a particularly large flowered, but I've always loved this plant because it always does so well year in and year out. And it's been blooming here probably for at least six weeks now. So it has a very long bloom period to it as well. So, If you buy a clematis or clematis, how do you plant it? Well, though, I think the one really key cultural thing to remember with this group of plants is, is to plant deep, especially here in the north. So whereas most plants we would recommend people when they buy, a, and most people are going to buy them as potted plants, mm -hmm. uh, but this really holds true whether you buy a potted plant or if you're buy, buying a dormant bare root plant. Most often we're going to plant even, you know, that the, with the, for taking it out of a pot, we're going to plant it at the same level in the garden that it was in the pot. With, with clematis, you really want to drop them. You want to drop them so that that's two to three inches below. So the top of the soil line in your pot is two to three inches into the ground. They benefit in our harsh winter climate from being planted a little bit deeper as opposed to too shallow. And the, the advantage, what actually happens with that, if you plant that deep, then that plant actually will form roots off of the stem that you've buried. Um, and it just gives it a better, quicker start. And it also minimizes the chance for winter injury when we have those really open, cold, snowless winters. Mm -hmm. That's not a typically a problem with most types of clematis here. There are some that are not winter hardy for us here that we can't even touch. The uh, uh, Clematis Montana and some of the evergreen type Clematis that come from uh, Australia, New Zealand, just aren't winter hardy for us here. Um, so, you know, we can't even do those. But even these ones that we tend to rely on that we know are good performers, plant them a little bit deeper. That's the one really key thing to remember with them. Do you recommend mulching them over the winter? You know, that, the answer to that question is really tied to the type of clematis again. And I, we probably should talk about this because in terms of how these plants behave in the landscape and how we prune them and treat them, there actually belong, there's three different groups. So there's a group of clematis that flower on old wood only. So in order to get flowers on those, we have to find a way to preserve the woody stem through the winter. That's difficult for us here in the far north. And usually to do that, uh, to do it effectively, we have to actually lay them down for the winter. So in a case of like here at the Arboretum where they're growing on the chicken wire, we could unhook the chicken wire from the top and just lay the whole plant flat on the ground for the winter and then mulch it. So those are challenging and difficult and most gardeners here in the north don't want to deal with that. So we don't tend to grow them a lot. Then there's a second group that flowers on both old and new wood. So if you can preserve the wood through the winter from the previous year, you'll get earlier flowering. Sometimes you'll get a little bit different, on certain varieties you'll get a little bit different flower color. And you, in certain varieties you'll see double flowers on old wood and single flowers on new wood. And again, it's the same thing. You have to find a way to protect those stems if you want to get that flowering on old wood. If you, if, if you don't get it, it's not a big deal with those because even if you don't get the first crop of flowers on old wood, you will get a new crop of flowers on the new wood. The third group is the one I think for all practical purposes is what's most practical for us here in the north, and that's the, all the types that flower on new wood. So those can kill to the snow line, or they can kill to the ground. You can prune them off and fall to the ground if you want to, and you're still going to get a good show of flowers every year. Um, you know, and I think that's probably what most gardeners are looking for. Uh, they don't want to put all the effort, unless it's a really special plant, you probably don't want to put the effort to protect this thing every winter, like you have to do with certain roses in this climate. It takes a little bit extra time and effort. And the palette of types that flower on new wood is very large. In fact, most of the varieties are ones that flower on new wood. So when you're shopping in the garden center, most tags have gotten pretty good at telling you that now, what, what group it's in, group one, group two, or group three. I'm making most of my selections based upon group three, where even if they say they kill the snow, I'm still going to get a good, good show of flowers the next year. So should we be pruning our uh, clematis in the fall or in the spring? Or fill us in on that, what you recommend? Well, my philosophy on that is, again, remember where you're gardening. You're in a, the far north with very cold winters. And, and any time you open up a wound on a plant late in the season, that's an avenue for winter injury to occur. And, you know, not to say it's going to happen every year, but I, my recommendation to people is wait till spring. 
wait till the, or at least wait till the coldest part of winter is gone, and that will minimize the potential for any crown injury to get in through those wounds. You know, it's kind of the same thing with how we treat perennial gardens. A lot of people, as you said, like to have everything neat and tidy for the winter and take everything away. The negative that goes along with that, and the same is true here with, with, uh, with these vining plants, is that removing all that removes any protection whatsoever for the crown. And so leaves that might fall off the clematis and, and gather at the base of the plant that may provide winter protection. If you take it all away, you don't have that. If you're gonna have good snow cover every winter, it's not an issue. My eyes tell people, if you're gonna cut your garden down in fall, my recommendation is that you put a winter mulch on it then as an insurance to minimize any chance for winter injury. So, but I think, I'd say if you can wait, do it in spring. Do you get a bushier plant if you do trim it down and prune it down? You can actually manipulate this plant quite a bit if you want in, in terms of when it emerges in spring. Um, you can pinch the number of stems. If you don't want as many stems or it's full of plant, you want larger flowers. Kind of the same principles that go along with pinching mums and asters and some of that kind of thing. You can practice that with these. But I think most people are more interested in full foliage cover and as much bloom as possible and would sacrifice the large flowers for having more flowers. And so in general, no, you don't have to do anything really with them. You can manipulate bloom season a little bit by uh, pinching back select stems in spring that will retard the bloom on those stems. So if you let some grow naturally, you'll get the early flush of flowers and those ones that you pinched back early in spring will flower later. So you can, even though many of these by nature bloom for many weeks, you can push that window of bloom even longer by pinching select stems early in the season. Uh, do we have to worry about any disease problems at all with, uh, with this great vine? Well, generally they're, as a general rule, they're pretty pest and disease free plants. We do on occasion run into uh, a wilt that will take, typically will take select stems out of a plant. Rarely does, does this kill a plant. It might kill a very young plant that doesn't have multiple stems. But you may see by this time of year um, that you've got a plant in the, in the garden or in the landscape and there's two or three stems that have browned out, wilted up and browned up all the way through. And the rest of the plant looks fine. That's probably a, a fungal wilt. And there's still debate as to which fungi are involved in this. Um, it is tied somewhat to weather environmental conditions. Uh, with a wet early season that we had this year, this is a year where we would expect to see some. The re my recommendation to people on that is when you see that happen, if you have a select stem that wilts out within the clump, just simply remove that, uh, take it all the way, cut it all the way down below where, you know, if it's died all the way to the ground, cut it all the way to the ground and remove that and get it out of there. Um, the reason for that, of course, this is a fungus. So it's gonna spread by spores. The spores are gonna overwinter on the foliage. Sanitation is the number one most important thing you can do. People may run into that on occasion. It's not common um, and it's pretty easy to deal with. And I say rarely does it kill a plant, very rarely. Do we have to worry at all about insects, uh, spider mites, aphids or anything? Not typically. If a plant's grown under good culture, if it's not stressed, and a lot of, a lot of pest issues I think in landscapes are very much tied to stress factors that are on the plant. So if you grow your, your, your clematis or clematis under good culture, and that is uh, soil that's uh, evenly moist, they do not like to fluctuate from very moist to very dry, they like more of that evenly moist, which we talked about earlier with mulches and those kind of things. If you have that and you've got the proper amount of light, um, you know, and they're not super heavy feeders, uh, you know, actually some, su some supplemental feeding through the season with, with soluble type fertilizers is going to enhance vigor and it's going to give you more bloom, but they're, pretty, they're really plants of pretty easy culture. And if you give them that, uh, that kind of culture and take good care of them, I don't think, you know, typically you're not going to run into pest and disease problems with them. It would be really nice if you would be willing to walk through and show us some of the beautiful varieties that are blooming here and maybe talk about the different types and the different flower types. Um, so let's go take a walk. I have a question. I'd like to attract woodpeckers in my yard. What would you recommend? Well, the woodpeckers are here year-round, so it's really nice to, to uh, have something that we can uh, provide food for, for them. Uh, this is the feeder I really like. It's a recycled 
feeder. And what it allows the woodpeckers to do is to fly on top of the feeder and then just hop around underneath where I have the food. So they can hang on to the wires underneath and uh, they love the, the uh, different kinds of suet that we buy. Uh, I found that they really like the peanut butter suet the best, but you could use uh, beef suet uh, that you could get in butcher stores now, uh, but also uh, the uh, chickadees and nuthatches will come to a, to a feeder like this. The other thing is a feeder like this keeps uh, birds out that you don't want, like sparrows, because the sparrows can't get underneath here and hang on, whereas the, the different woodpeckers and the nuthatches and chickadees can hang on. Uh, all of these species are here year-round for us, so they can provide enjoyment throughout the year uh, if we just give them a nice food supply and a nice feeder like this. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, we thought we might take a look at a few of the wonderful varieties that are out here at the Arboretum today and show you some of these. And uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, a group called the Viticella types, which are actually uh, European in origin. This is a, an oldie but a goodie within that group. It's a variety called Mrs. Betty Corning. And you can see it's obviously a small flowered type. Uh, it's kind of past its peak of bloom here, but we still got, a, we still got a, a reasonably nice show of flowers. One of the reasons why I really like this group is for, from the screening aspect. I think that's why a lot of people want to grow these. They want the flowers, but they also want nice foliage that's going to screen something, like we were talking earlier about maybe screening a, a part of the farmyard or something. These Viticella types will certainly do that. You can see the wonderful, lustrous green foliage that's on them. And uh, when this was in full bloom, it was actually covered in flowers. So, so I think that's just an example of a really, really good type for us here. They're absolutely rock solid, hardy through the winter. They flower on the new wood. So if this baby dies to the ground, that's great. Next to it here, we have a, a, a near species type uh, called Durandi. And this is an interesting plant because it is not one of the climbers. It looks like a vine here, but, but the gardeners here have worked with this a little bit to get it to weave up through the chicken wire. So this one will not climb on its own. And so, it, uh, so this, as I said, could be grown as a sprawling ground cover if you wanted to, or uh, treated as it's been done here. And it's got kind of an interesting, real simple flower, a four, uh, four uh, petal flower, and actually, uh, what really creates the show in clematis is not petals. In most cases, what you're looking at, the, the showy parts of the flower, what we're looking at here are actually the sepals. Um, and in, in most clematis, petal, the true petals are non-existent. And these are in the buttercup family, so a lot of members of that family uh, have similar kinds of flowering traits to them. So, so that again, we're, we're kind of close to the end here with this one, few flowers left. but. Notice what's starting to happen here. The, the seed heads that are starting to come on, uh, these have a really kind of a wonderful golden tint to them right now. And uh, this will add interest as we progress into late summer, into fall, and the fall landscape as well. You had talked about um, that sometimes there is a wilt on uh, that causes yes. a branch to die. Could that be what's happening yes, here? Yes, good, good, good point, Mary. That Yes, we do see this stem here that's all browned out. and. Uh, if we, uh, if we follow that stem all the way down, you'll see, you can see it's browned out all the way down. Right. This is very likely probably uh, a wilt that's in this one stem. And you'll see in this plant, it's one stem. The rest of the plant really looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we've identified that. We're going to come back here with our pruners and we're going to follow that stem all the way down to the ground uh, and cut it off at the base at ground level and then just simply pull all that out of here and destroy it, get it out of the garden because this is a, fun, a fungal issue and so the spores that spread this fungus from one plant to another are going to overwinter on foliage and so we don't want to leave this in the garden because it's inoculum for a spread in the future as well. So, okay. so that's kind of what you might see happen on occasion in some of these and it's a pretty simple thing to take care of and like I said earlier, rarely does it kill the plant kind of more of an aesthetic issue than anything as mm -hmm. you can see there so okay and then we have one other one down here which uh, also another uh, uh, vitacella type but one that uh, again very small flowered uh, real pale 
uh, blue color, really kind of a pretty little thing. But that's pretty typical of the flower shape that we expect out of this type of clematis. Small flowered, pendant, uh, bell-shaped types of bloom. And again, uh, we're close to the end on this one, but we still got a pretty nice show there as well. And there is a whole range of color variants within this group. Again, look at the great foliage, foliage cover that we've got here uh, and the great screening effect that it's going to give in the landscape. Very beautiful. Now, Mary, here, here's an interesting uh, group of clematis. This is, this is one called Duchess of Albany, and it's uh, representative of a group of, of clematis that we call the Texensis group. And, and this is an interesting group because um, there's uh, maybe eight or ten varieties within this group. They're all derived uh, out of a species called Texensis, which is native in southern United States. And if you look at the native range of this, you would think you'd question right away whether it was hardy here in, up here in the far north, but it is. It's very, very winter hardy. And look at the unique shape here. Again, more of that urn-shaped kind of flower, but not, not pendant, but a little bit more out-facing. And so it's a little bit different look than, than, than the previous ones we've looked at here. Again, it's a great group of uh, plants that flower on the current year's wood, great winter hardiness, good vigor, um, and, uh, you know, it certainly, I think, uh, falls in there along with the Jackmanai types as some of the better types of clematis for us here in the far north. So, um, and there are some other color variants within this group as well. This is just one example, but I think it's a fun plant. It's a little more subtle. It uh, doesn't scream out at you from a distance. You kind of got to get up there to see the beauty of those flowers, mm -hmm. but it's really, really quite a showy plant to have in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary, this is an example of, of, of another group of clematis called the uh, Tangutica group. And this particular variety we're looking at here is called Helios. And uh, this, th these are all Asian in origin. Again, are plants that have good vigor. This is a plant that does die totally to the ground, and here we are. Uh, you know, in mid to late summer and it's standing eight feet tall and just kind of coming into flower. These are nice because they're later blooming and uh, not large flowered again, but will a it was absolutely smothered in flowers when it's in full bloom. And I think we're also starting just to beginning to see uh, the seed heads again that are, that are going to be prominent and showy on this as we get uh, into the late season. This is just an example, I think, of again in a landscape situation of how you can use a clematis beyond just putting it onto a trellis or a fence. Uh, there is there's actually an upright support in here that this has climbed up onto. You can't see it right now. And it, this is adding great vertical interest in this portion of the landscape at this time. So uh, this is some of what we kind of talked about earlier in terms of uh, thinking of other ways we can utilize some of these plants in the landscape. And here it is in the rose garden adding interest and giving us that great de de uh, deal of verticality at this point in the season. So. Well, Mike, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. This has been so good and so educational and so fun. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org